This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, The Washington Post is reporting the Biden administration's ruled out the idea of pushing Ukraine to negotiate with Russia to end the war, even though many U.S. officials believe neither side is, quote, capable of winning the war outright. This comes as the war in Ukraine appears to be escalating on a number of fronts. On Saturday, a massive explosion damaged a key bridge connecting Russia to, the, to Crimea, which Moscow annexed in 2014. Russian President Vladimir Putin accused Ukraine of committing what he called a terrorist act. Since then, Russian missiles have struck over a dozen Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv and Lviv, killing at least 20 people. On Tuesday night, President Biden was interviewed by Jake Tapper on CNN. Would you be willing to meet with him at the G20? Look, I have no intention of meeting with him. But, uh, for example, if he came to me at the G20 and said, I want to talk about the release of Griner, I'd meet with him. I mean, it would depend. But I, 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 I can't imagine. Look, we've taken a position. I just did a G7 meeting this morning. The idea, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. So I'm not about to, nor is anyone else, prepared to negotiate with Russia about them staying in Ukraine, keeping any part of Ukraine, et cetera. Despite Biden's comments, there are growing calls for the U.S. to push for negotiations. On Sunday, General Mike Mullen, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, appeared on ABC this week. It also speaks to the need, I think, to get to the table. I'm a little concerned about the language, you know, which uh, we're about at the top, if you President will. President Biden's language. President Biden's language. We're about at the top of uh, the language scale, if you will. Uh, so, and I think we need to back off that a little bit and do everything we possibly can to try to get to the table to resolve this thing. We're joined now by two guests, Medea Benjamin, co-founder of the peace group Code Pink, and Nicholas J.S. Davies. They're the co-authors of the forthcoming book, War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Medea, let's begin with you in Washington, D.C. I mean, you look at this past week, um, the massive raining down of missiles and drone strikes by the Russian military across Ukraine, all the way into western Ukraine and places like Lviv and the capital, Kyiv. Um, and you see that President, that President Putin is threatening to use a nuclear bomb. Is negotiation possible? What would that look like? And what needs to happen to accomplish that? Negotiations are not only possible, they are absolutely essential. There have been some negotiations on uh, key issues so far, such as the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, uh, such as getting the grain out of Ukraine, uh, such as the prisoner swaps. But there have been no negotiations on the big issues. And uh, Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state, has not met with Lavrov. We just heard in that clip how Biden does not want to talk to Putin. Uh, the only way this war is going to end is by negotiations. And we have seen the U.S. actually torpedo negotiations, starting from the proposals that the Russians put forward right before the invasion, uh, which was summarily dismissed by the U.S. And then we saw when the uh, Turkish government was mediating talks at the end of March, early April, how it was the uh, U.K. president, Boris Johnson, as well as Secretary of Defense Austin, uh, who torpedoed those negotiations. So, uh, I don't think that um, it is realistic to think that there is going to be a clear victory by the Ukrainians that are going to be able to get back every inch of territory, like they're now saying, including Crimea and all of Donbass. Uh, there has to be compromises on both sides. And we, the American public, have to push the White House and our leaders in Congress to call for proactive negotiations now. Uh, Medea, could you be a little more specific about those talks uh, that occurred, uh, 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 sponsored by Turkey and uh, and also Israel, as I understand, in terms of uh, what was the potential uh, way forward 
uh, to a ceasefire that was torpedoed, because most Americans are not aware uh, that early in the war there was a possibility of being able to uh, stop the, fi the fighting. Well, yes, and we go into great detail in our book, War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict, about exactly what happened there and how the proposal that included neutrality for Ukraine, uh, 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 removal of Russian troops, uh, how the uh, Donbass region was really going to be uh, going back to the Minsk Accords that were uh, never fulfilled. Uh, and there was a, a very positive response from the Ukrainians to the Russian proposals. Uh, and then we saw Boris Johnson coming to meet with Zelensky and saying that the, quote, collective West uh, was not about to make an agreement uh, with the Russians and was there to support Ukraine in this fight. And then we saw the same kind of message coming from the Secretary of Defense, Austin, who said that the goal was to weaken Russia. So the goalpost changed, and that uh, entire agreement was blown up. And we now see that Zelensky, from once saying that uh, he was accepting neutrality for Ukraine, is now calling for fast-tracking uh, NATO uh, application for Ukraine. Uh, and we see the Russians that have also hardened their views uh, by having these uh, referendum and then trying to annex these four provinces. Uh, so, if, if that agreement had actually moved forward, I think we would have seen an end, an end to this war. It's going to be harder now, uh, but it's still the only way forward. And, and the the fact that President Biden is still discounting the possibility of talks with uh, uh, Russia, uh, those of us old enough to remember the Vietnam War understand that the United States, while fighting in the Vietnam War, spent five years at the negotiating table uh, in uh, uh, in Paris uh, between 1968 and 1973 in peace talks with the National Liberation Front of Vietnam and the Vietnamese government. So it's not unheard of that you can have peace talks uh, while a war is still uh, going on. I'm yes, wondering but your Juan, thoughts about that. Yes, we don't want to see these peace talks going on for five years. Uh, we want to see peace talks that come to an agreement very soon, because this war is affecting the entire world. We're seeing a rise in hunger. We're seeing a rise in the use of dirty energy. We're seeing a rise in a hardening of uh, militarists throughout the world and increased expenditures on militarism, a strengthening of NATO. Uh, and we're seeing the real possibility of nuclear war. So we can't afford, uh, as a globe, to allow this to keep going on for years. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important uh, that the progressive people in this country uh, recognize that there is not one Democrat who voted against the $40 billion package uh, to Ukraine or the more recent $13 billion package, uh, that this issue is actually uh, being questioned by the right, the extreme right in this country. It's being questioned also by Donald Trump, who said that if he had been president, this war wouldn't happen. Uh, he would have probably talk to Putin, which is right. Uh, so uh, we've got to build an opposition movement uh, from the left to say that uh, uh, we want the Democrats in Congress uh, to join with any Republicans that will join in this uh, to put pressure on Biden. Right now, uh, the head of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, is having a hard time even getting her Progressive Caucus to sign on to a very moderate letter saying that we should pair the military assistance to Ukraine with a diplomatic push. So it's our job now to really create the momentum for diplomacy. Uh, in April, uh, the U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson met with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. It's been reported Johnson pressured Zelensky to cut off peace negotiations with Russia. This is then-Prime Minister Johnson being interviewed by Bloomberg News back in May. As any such uh, you know, proponent of, of a deal with Putin, how can you deal? Yeah. How can you deal with a crocodile uh, when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Uh, you know, what's the, what's the negotiation? Uh, and, and that is what Putin is doing. And any kind of, he will try to freeze the conflict. He will try and call for a ceasefire while he remains in possession of, uh, of substantial parts of, of Ukraine. And you say that to Emmanuel Macron? And I, I make that point to all my friends and colleagues. 
colleagues in the in the G7 and at NATO. And by the way, everybody gets that. Once once you go through the logic, you can see that it's very very difficult you must to, get a, to, to get a negotiated solution. I wanted to bring Nicholas Davies into the conversation, co-author of War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict, the significance of what Boris Johnson said, and also the attempts of some in the U.S. Congress to push for negotiation, very different what, from what uh, the former prime minister was saying in Britain, like uh, Congress member Pramila Jayapal, who drafted a congressional sign-on letter calling on Biden to take steps to end the Ukraine war, um, using through several steps, including a negotiated ceasefire and new security agreements with Ukraine. So far, only Congress member Nydia Velasquez has uh, signed on as a co-sponsor. So if you can talk about the pressure. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the effect of what we're seeing uh, is effectively a sort of ratcheting up of tensions. If, if uh, the U.S. and the U.K. are willing to uh, uh, torpedo negotiations when they're happening, but then they're not willing to, uh, you, you know, they're willing to they're willing to go and tell uh, Zelensky and Ukraine what to do when it's a matter of killing the negotiations. But now Biden says he's not willing to tell them to restart negotiations. So, so it's pretty clear where that leads, which is to endless war. But the, the truth is that every war ends at the negotiating table. And at the U.N. General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, uh, world leaders, one after the other, stepped up to remind uh, NATO and Russia and Ukraine of that. And that the, what the U.N. Charter calls for is for the peaceful resolution of conflicts through diplomacy and negotiation. The U.N. Charter does, does not say that when a country commits aggression that they should therefore be subjected to an endless war that kills millions of people. That is just might makes right. Um, so, uh, actually, 66 countries spoke up at the U.N. General Assembly to restart peace negotiations and ceasefire negotiations as soon as possible. And that included, for instance, the foreign minister of India, who said, I'm being pr we're being pressured to take sides here, but we have been clear from the very beginning that we are on the side of peace. And, and this, this is what the world is calling for. Those 66 countries uh, include India and China, with billions of people. Those 66 countries represent the majority of the world's population. They are mostly from the global south. Their people are already suffering from the shortages of food coming from Ukraine and, and Russia. They are facing the prospect of famine. And, and on top of that, we're now facing a serious danger of nuclear war. Matthew Bunn, who's a nuclear weapons expert at Harvard University, told NPR the other day that he estimates a 10 to 20 percent chance of the use of nuclear weapons uh, in, in Ukraine or, or over, over Ukraine. And, um, and, and that was before the uh, incident on the Kerch Strait Bridge. And, and the retaliatory bombing by Russia. So if this, if both sides just keep escalating, what will Matthew Bunn's estimate of, of the chance of nuclear war be in a few months' time or a year's time? And, and, and Joe Biden himself, at a fundraiser at media mogul James Murdoch's house, just chatting with his, his financial backers in front of the press, said he does not believe that either side can use a tactical nuclear weapon without it then escalating to Armageddon. And so here we are. We have gone from early April, when uh, President Zelensky went on TV 
and told his people that the goal is peace and the restoration of normal life as soon as possible in our native state. We have gone from, from Zelensky negotiating for peace, a 15-point peace plan that, that really looked very, very promising, to now a rising, a real prospect of the use of nuclear weapons, with the, you know, the danger rising all the time. This, this is just not good enough. This is, this is not responsible leadership from Biden or Johnson and now Truss in the UK. Um, Johnson claimed, when he went to Kiev on April the 9th, that he was speaking for, quote, the collective West. But a month later, Emmanuel Macron of France and Olaf Scholz of Germany and uh, Mario Draghi of Italy all put out new calls for new negotiations. You know, they, they seem to have uh, uh, whipped them back into line now, but, but really, the, the world is desperate for peace in Ukraine right now. And Nicholas Davis, if that's the case, why do you see so little in the way of peace movements uh, at the in the in the in the populations of the uh, advanced Western countries at this stage? Well, actually, there are quite quite large and regular uh, uh, peace demonstrations in Berlin and and other other places around Europe. Um, there have been bigger demonstrations in the UK than in the US. And, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, all credit to my co-writer here, Medea, because uh, she has been working so, so hard, along with, you know, all of Code Pink and uh, the members of Peace Action, Veterans for Peace, and, and other peace organizations in the United States. Oh, no, I, I, and really, but the, the public, the public really needs to understand uh, the situation. And, um, you know, this is why we, we've written this book, to try and give people, it's a, it's a short book, about 200 pages of basic primer to, the people, to give people a clearer understanding of how we got into this crisis, the role of, of our own government in, in, in helping to set the stage for this um, over, the, over the years leading up to it, uh, you know, through NATO expansion and through um, the events of 2014 in Ukraine and uh, the in installation of a government there that, according to a Gallup poll in April 2014, uh, barely 50 percent of Ukrainians even considered it a legitimate government. Um, and, and, and that pr provoked uh, the secession of, of Crimea and a civil war in Donbass, you know, that killed 14,000 people by the time uh, the Minsk peace, the, the Minsk II peace accord was signed a year later. Um, and we, ha we have a lot more about all of this in our book, and we really hope people will will get a copy and read it, and join. And, uh, and the Nicholas, peace if I can, uh, I, I wanted to bring in uh, Medea again. Speaking of uh, peace, uh, Medea, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee recently gave uh, the, the Nobel Prize uh, to a, a group of uh, civil society groups in Belarus. Uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, and in Ukraine it was the uh, the the Center for Civil Liberties. You wrote a uh, a piece in Common Dreams this week talking about the criticism of that prize by a leading uh, pacifist uh, in Ukraine uh, who criticized the uh, the Center for Civil Liberties for embracing the agendas of international donors like the State Department and the National Endowment for Democracy. Could you elaborate on that and the, the, the lack of attention in the West to civil liberties violations inside of Ukraine? Well, yes, we were quoting a leading uh, war resistor pacifist inside Ukraine uh, that said that that organization that won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, was following the agenda of the West, uh, was not 
uh, calling for peace talks, but was actually calling for more weapons, uh, was not uh, uh, would not uh, allow for the discussion of violations of human rights on the side of Ukraine, uh, and would not support those uh, who were being beaten up or otherwise abused for not wanting to fight. And so our piece was to say that a Nobel Prize should really be going to those organizations uh, in Russia. Uh, Ukraine, Belarus, that are supporting the war resistors. And, of course, we know there are many, many thousands of them uh, inside Russia who are uh, trying to flee the country and having a hard time finding uh, asylum, especially uh, coming to the United States. Uh, but, Juan, before we go, I just wanted to correct something that Amy said about Pramila Jayapal's letter. Uh, it has I, 26 members of Congress uh, that have signed it now, uh, and we're still pushing to get more uh, signing it. So I, I just wanted people to be clear uh, that there still is a moment now to be calling your members of Congress and to be pushing them to call for diplomacy. That's very significant, 26 members. Do you feel like there is a push in Congress now, that there is a kind of changing of the tide? I didn't realize that many had signed on. And also, finally, are you concerned about this last week, um, uh, Putin uh, pointing this head of military operations, Sergei Sorovkin, known as the butcher of Syria, as General Armageddon, and this uh, massive bombing by missiles and drone strikes? across Ukraine and the killings of scores of people? Well, of course, we're concerned about it. Our whole effort in this uh, writing this book, and we produced a 20-minute video, uh, is to show people the terrible devastation for the Ukrainian people that this war is causing. Uh, and in terms of Congress, uh, we think that 26 members is uh, actually quite pathetic, um, that it should be all members of Congress. Why is it a difficult thing to call for negotiations? This letter isn't even saying uh, cut off the military aid. Uh, so we think this is something that uh, all members of Congress should be supporting, and the fact that they're not is quite astounding. And really reflects that we don't have uh, a movement in this country that, that is strong enough right now uh, to change the tide. Uh, and that's why we're on a 50-city speaking tour. We're calling on people to invite us to their communities. Uh, we're calling on people to do house parties, read the book, show the video. Uh, this is a, a turning point in history. Uh, we've talked about the potential of nuclear war. Um, well, we are the ones that are going to have to stop it uh, by getting our elected representatives uh, to reflect our desire uh, for peace talks immediately to end this conflict before we uh, start seeing a nuclear war. Medea Benjamin, we want to thank you and Nicholas Davies, co-authors of the book War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict.